Are you a service-oriented person? There are two types, those who live to serve and the others who live to be served. The world is filled with both, and so are churches. So, what about you? Welcome to the Bible Study Hour, a radio and internet program with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. Today, we're going to look at the very first deacons. We'll learn what God intended by setting up deacons in the church and be able to discuss how closely our own churches model this teaching from the book of Acts. Let's listen now to Dr. Boyce. We're studying together the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, a chapter that begins with another problem in the church. I guess the good days are over. We started out in the book of Acts with what seems to be a description of an absolutely model church, a fabulous church. After Pentecost, the church is described at the end of chapter 2 in glowing terms, a church devoted to the apostles' teaching, that is, to the truth, and to the fellowship, that is, to one another, and to the breaking of bread, that is, to the sacraments that God has given, and to prayer, that is, devotional life. It describes in those early days how God blessed it richly. That church had the favor of all the people, and God added to it daily the numbers of those who should be saved. We found at the end of chapter 4 that the same thing was true. All the believers were in one mind. They shared everything they had. They spent their time praising God and testifying to the people, and God was adding to their number. Yet we come to chapter 5, and we have that sad scene of the dissimulation of Ananias and Sapphira. And now in chapter 6, we find another problem. This problem is quite different. The first one was a matter of deception. Ananias and Sapphira having sold a piece of land and then bringing part of the amount of the sale and presenting it and pretending it was the whole. They were singing. I don't know if they had the song back then, but they were certainly singing their equivalent of our little song, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. But they weren't doing it, they were keeping back part. And we've got to be careful, especially when we sing that song. Fortunately, it's not in our hymn book, we never sing it here. But whenever we're tempted to say, oh, I have laid all on the altar, I have given up everything for Jesus, we have to be very careful because it's probably the case that we haven't. At any rate, Ananias and Sapphira hadn't. What's more, they knew they hadn't, which made the situation serious. You see, you can think that you're giving all, and the Lord just has to teach you that there's a lot more to give. But in their case, they knew they weren't doing it. That was a serious, serious problem. But now in chapter 6, it's a different kind of problem, as I said. This isn't a problem of anybody being particularly evil, lying to the Holy Spirit. It's just a question of administration, situation was this. There were people in Jerusalem, as we know, that spoke a variety of languages. We know that because of Pentecost. All those people that were there at the time of the feast heard the early preaching, each one in his or her own language, and then it lists all those nations. So there were many different kinds of people. What's described in chapter 6 is a division in the church along linguistic lines. There were Aramaic-speaking people, the ones that spoke what we call Hebrew, though it was the version of it spoken in that day, Aramaic, the language that Jesus undoubtedly spoke. And then there were the congregations of those who spoke Greek. Greek was the lingua franca of the day. It was the language everybody spoke. It's how you did your commerce in Greek. Nobody knew Hebrew in other parts of the world, and even Latin wasn't that well known, although it was the Roman Empire, but Greek was the language they spoke. So all these other nationalities that were present in Jerusalem, they didn't know Hebrew or Aramaic, could get along by speaking Greek. And so you had a division in the church, and not theological or due to personalities or anything like that, but just a natural division along language lines. Those who spoke Aramaic 
would gather together in the house churches. And there were others who spoke Greek. It doesn't say this exactly, but presumably they would gather together. Now, they knew one another. They were part of the same church. I'm sure the apostles ministered in one congregation as well as the other. And who knows? They might have spoken Greek very well, some of the apostles. Uh, Probably they did. So it wasn't a terrible thing, but there was a division. And out of this division, a natural division, not sinful in itself, there grew a serious misunderstanding. Those in the Greek community, those who spoke Greek, began to complain against those in the Aramaic congregations that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of the food. Now, it's interesting that should come in here. We haven't been told anything about it, and presumably it's introduced the way it is because on that day everybody who read this would understand the background and know what was involved. One of the great duties that was imposed upon Jewish people under the Old Testament law was the care of the widows and orphans. You just couldn't pretend to be a pious Israelite if you didn't take care of the widows and orphans. Now, there were times they were neglected. The reason we know that is because there are warnings, especially in the minor prophets, to do it, that it was a sinful thing to neglect it. So they obviously had neglected it at times, but generally that was done. And this early church was doing that with its own widows. There were provisions, they being Jews, for those needs to be met by the Jewish synagogue through ministration at the temple. Money was collected for that purpose, and they were entitled to that. But things were not all that good between the temple authorities and the early Christian community. We've already seen that. And so rather than depend upon the temple authorities to take care of the widows, which they might have had, we would say, a legal right to do, these early communities were taking care of the widows by themselves, which was entirely right. There's a lesson there that ought to spill over to our relationship to government. The churches are all too ready to have the civil government take care of all our social problems. Things would be much better if we took care of our own social problems. But at any rate, these early Christians were doing that. And the widows of the Greek-speaking communities were part of that, except that these Greek congregations felt that their widows weren't quite getting enough or getting fair treatment or perhaps we're being overlooked or disqualified along the way. Now, how are they going to deal with this? It's interesting that in this occasion, they didn't have divine intervention, which is what happened in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. We don't find that they had a prayer meeting, though I'm sure the apostles prayed about it. What we have here is an administrative decision. They looked at the situation and no doubt guided by God said to those who were members of the church, the apostles speaking, it isn't right for us now to get involved in this in order to take care of this problem and carry out this ministry ourselves to make sure it's done right. We have other things to do. Our calling is to prayer and to the proclamation of the word, the teaching. But you have capable people among you. You all elect people that can carry on this responsibility. And that's what the church did, and this tells us about those who were elected. I think it's interesting to compare what they did do, which was a very wise solution to the problem, with what they might have done based on the kind of knowledge we have of the church since. Here were people in the church who were complaining. You know the church as well as I do. You know what happens sometimes when you have people that are complaining. Some branches of the Christian church solve that by throwing the complainers out. I can name institutions that do that, not always churches. Sometimes schools do that to those that dissent from the prevailing theology or views of the administration. Here are people causing trouble. Let's just get rid of them. Well, if there had been anything like a division beforehand because of the language, which wasn't serious, it would have become serious at that point. You would have had the first apostolic church of Jerusalem, And across the street on the other corner, you would have had the second apostolic church of Jerusalem. The first would have spoken Aramaic, the second would have spoken Greek, and neither would have spoken to the other. That's what would have happened. They didn't do that. Another solution that is sometimes followed in the churches is that you just shun the difficult people. Don't throw them out, but after all, if they're going to make problems, we just aren't going to talk to them. Just let them sit there by themselves a while and see how they like it. And that'll teach them not to make any trouble anymore. Sometimes that is done. One of the things we do is to outvote the dissenters. You call a meeting and you get everybody to speak. 
and you make your motion, and you're very careful that you follow Robert's rules of order, because the dissenters are the ones that always appeal most vigorously to Robert's rules of order, and you follow that, and then when you have your motion, and your second, and your vote, and you've had your motion to cut off debate, and you voted on that, no debate being allowed on that kind of a motion, and a mere majority prevails, and you shut off debate, and then you have your vote, and well, it's all been done democratically. And so after that, they have to keep quiet because the decision has been made. Sometimes in the church, we say 51% of the vote is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is how God speaks. I have heard that said, seriously, in some churches. Sometimes people separate from the dissenters. You know, they're problematic. They're creating trouble. We'll go off by ourselves, and we'll start our own pure church. And that's fine, of course, until somebody dissents in that church. And then you start another church, another pure one, and then another pure one, and the pure church gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually it's gone. It seems to me that's not the ideal solution. I guess they could have formed a committee. That is another approach. And if you think about this, you know, you get carried away by it. I was talking to uh, Roger Nicole on the way to the airport this afternoon. He's flying back to Boston, and he was saying, oh, you got a good text tonight. And we got talking about this. He said, oh, yes, I preached on that once. And he said, I made a list of all the solutions they didn't use. There were ten of them on his list. So you can, I've given five. You can think of five more, ten more, maybe twenty more, all the different things that are done in the church. But they didn't do that. They went to the congregation itself, and I suspect uh, chiefly appealing to those who were complaining of the difficulty. And they said, look, just choose people who, in your judgment, are well able to carry out the solution, are able to handle this. In other words, they weren't protecting their rights. They weren't even protecting their point of view. They said, look, this is a problem we shouldn't have. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We ought to be one. We ought to love one another. We ought to fellowship together. What we want to be is effective in the proclamation of the gospel. We don't want anything to besmirch our reputation before the world. So work it out. Work it out however you care to work it out. And they got together, and you know what they did. The whole group, that is the whole church, got together, and they chose these first deacons, seven of them. And the significant thing about their choice is that every one of these men, to judge from his name, was a Greek-speaking Christian. You see, the Greeks were saying that it was their widows who were neglected. So the church as a whole, and I would imagine there were more Aramaic-speaking Christians in the church. I think of the maturity here. We would say, well, if we're going to elect seven, how are we going to apportion them? Ought to be a couple Greeks on there to represent the Greek point of view, but we are the majority of the church. We Aramaic-speaking Christians, at least four of the seven, maybe five of the seven ought to speak Aramaic, but they didn't uh, operate that way. They said, let's just pick out seven good men, and when they took the vote and added it all up, the ones they had chosen were the Greeks. Stephen, whom Luke says is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, we learn later in the book is the first person called an evangelist, very effective one, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, who was a convert to Judaism. Everyone, Greek names. I must say, to be perfectly honest, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were foreigners, non-Jews. Nicodemus has a Greek name, too, and he was a Jew. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. That may be the case. But if they weren't Greek speakers, if they weren't Greek by nationality, they were at least what were called Hellenists, that is, Jews who had such a disposition to Greek literature and knowledge that they had renamed themselves with Greek names. That's what Nicodemus was. He was a Hellenist, and they were at least that. So if they weren't Greek by nationality or foreigners, non-Jews, they were at least people who were thoroughly inclined to be supporting and appreciative of the Greek point of view. And these men then became the first official body of officers in the church other than the apostles themselves who were appointed by Jesus Christ. I want to say something about these men and how they functioned, uh, but before I do, it's really worth noticing what this tells us about leadership in the church, because although this is the first time they established a separate uh, body 
of officers to do a certain job. They did it according to principles that we find not only here but throughout the New Testament and particularly in Paul's letters as he gives instructions to the church as to how they're to carry out their affairs. One of the things we notice we shouldn't overlook it is that what you have in this election of deacons is what we would call a division of responsibilities. Sometimes in churches you get a couple people in charge of everything and they want to do everything. I was talking to somebody who was here this morning. As soon as I saw him, he was here with his family, I knew why he was here. He's having so much trouble in his own church that when it gets absolutely horrible, he comes from quite a distance, when it gets absolutely horrible, he comes here to get just a breath of fresh air and then he goes home and fights the battle some more. And when I saw him, I knew what was going on. I talked to him afterwards. He began to explain some of the problems. And the chief problem they have in their church is that the minister thinks he has to do everything. Do the preaching, make the decisions, do the evangelism, and what he says goes. He's not ready to listen to anybody else. Now, that isn't good. The thing that's wrong with that, and it happens more often than we would think, the thing that's wrong with that is that it denies the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ as a whole. And Paul writes about that in his letters, as he does at several points, talking about the gifts that are given to the church. He always lists a variety of gifts, and he says the Holy Spirit gives gifts to each one. He means everyone. Everyone who is a Christian is given a gift. And so if in the church you have people who are not exercising their gifts, what you have is an impoverished church. You have a preacher, no matter how multi-gifted he may be, he doesn't have all the gifts. And so those gifts that he doesn't have are being excluded or neglected, and the church is impoverished by just that amount. The ideal church. I have to face that. The ideal church is a church where every single believer is engaged in some work for Jesus Christ using the gift that he's given. We pay some attention here these days to the church growth people because as a church grows, you run into problems, which unless you've lived through it before, you really don't always understand. You have to kind of find your way as you go. Churches change as the numbers increase. And we sometimes go to the church growth people, people who have studied churches from a sociological point of view to see what kind of insight they give. And they say, you know, to have a healthy church as it grows, 60% of the people should be engaged in some kind of work. I don't know where that comes from. Those of you who are sociologists know how you come up with figures like that, 60% rather than 70% or something, but that's the figure they come up with. And I guess that's wonderful. If you have a church where 60% of the people are really engaged in something, then they're with the ministry, and it's a majority of the people, and the others who are out on the fringes tend to get drawn in. The church becomes stronger. But important and valuable and blessed as that would be, that still isn't the ideal. The ideal is 100%. And you see the apostles, with the wisdom given to them by God, were recognizing this and beginning to implement it in structural ways as they set up this order of the deacons. So that's the first thing. Second thing I want you to notice about principles of church government here is a plurality of leadership. That is not only a division of responsibility. We will be responsible for this, and you will be responsible for that, but a plurality of leadership even in the areas of particular responsibility. When they elected deacons, you see, they didn't elect just one. They didn't say, well, here we have a problem. Somebody has to take care of this distribution. Now pick out the best man you've got or the best woman you've got and let that one take care of it. They didn't do that. Instead, they picked a group. I have in my office somewhere a little sign that somebody gave me some years ago that says, God so loved the world that he didn't send a committee. And I read that, and I can well understand what that means. Committees are inefficient. Committees are slow. And sometimes you think, oh, it would be a whole lot better just to do away with a committee and make the decision and get the job done. And sometimes that works quite well. If you have a what we sometimes call a benevolent dictator, sometimes that's all right. You can get by on that for a while. But the problem is that no one... No one is without sin, and problems enter in in that way, and you don't have any way to correct it. It is significant, isn't it, when you study the New Testament as a whole and examine the churches and the structures they have, that the Holy Spirit, through Paul and the others that were responsible for doing this, never merely appointed one elder in any place to take care of the church. It's always elders. And in the Presbyterian churches, where elders are basic to the form of government, you know, you can't have 
a particular church, that is a church that's not a mission church getting underway, but an established church, a particular church, unless you have two or more elders. You say the principle is that of plurality, and it's very important. And here they had the seven deacons. Well, let me give you another principle. It's evident from this text. And they suggested that they choose people. They said, verse 3, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. See, what they're doing there is choosing people on the basis of their spiritual qualifications. Now, I know when you choose pastors, you're supposed to choose them on the basis of their spiritual qualifications. At least that's what everybody says. Except that when you talk to people afterwards in some churches, you find that the real reason is that they like the wave in the pastor's hair, if he had any. They like his smile in the pulpit, or they think he certainly tells funny jokes, or something like that. But at least we know when you choose pastors, ministers, you're supposed to choose them according to spiritual qualifications. But now look here, they're choosing deacons, and the job of the deacons is to distribute the food to those that are hungry. Why, the way we do that today, often, I'm not saying we do it here, but the way we do it often in the churches, is you say, well, you know, they might run short, and what we really need is men who have private resources, who, if food runs short, can supply the need out of their own pockets, or at least failing that, we need people who have experience in the stock market who can invest the bigger resources we have so we can live off the income from the stocks as they go up or down or whatever it may be. And and certainly we need people who can manage this well, people who've had experience in business and so on. I don't want to be misunderstood here. One of the good things in a church is that you have people with a variety of experience and have done all sorts of things, and that's often a great asset. But you see, when they're choosing leaders, people responsible, people to deal with these things, what the apostles were concerned about wasn't how rich they were, how much management experience they had, but whether they were spiritual or not. Because at its heart, you see, this was not a problem of money or lack of it or food or lack of it, but it was a spiritual problem. So they chose men who were known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. I sometimes said... I think from this pulpit that as I grow older, one of the things I'm most conscious of needing is wisdom. I think when you're younger, those of you who are younger, forgive me for saying this, but when you're younger, at least when you're very young, and I won't say where that is, when you're very young, basically you think you know almost everything. Now, maybe not absolutely everything, but everything essential. Those of you who have children know how wise children are in their own eyes. They hardly need to learn anything, and they certainly are much wiser than their parents. I think it was Mark Twain who said that when he was 15, he thought his father was an absolutely ignorant man. By the time he got to be 20, he was surprised to discover how much he had learned in the intervening five years. That's where we come from. And as you get older, things change, and you begin to realize that the problems we face aren't always susceptible to simple solutions. You wish they were. Sometimes they are. Some of the problems might be that we just don't see the simple solution. There might be a simple solution. We don't see it. But often the problems are greater than that, more complex than that. The greatest problem of all, the problem of sin, was solved by what kind of a solution? Was that a simple solution, the cross? Well, yes, in one sense it was. God's Son dying is so simple, you can tell it in a few words. But it's complex, too. We try to describe what was accomplished on the cross. The Bible is filled with terms like redemption, substitution, atonement, reconciliation, justification, all those words. You see, it's very hard to exhaust what happened there. Simple, yes, but complex too. And when we talk about our problems, we really do need wisdom. And these men had it. They dealt with things well, and we never hear of this problem again. The church in Jerusalem was poor. Certainly there were many people who were impoverished and lacked food, and yet we never hear of this again. I assume it means that these men and their successors really dealt with this and the other problems given to the deacons well. I want you to see something else about their spiritual qualifications. They were to be full of the Spirit also. Now that means spiritual men, yes, certainly that. But I pointed out earlier when we were talking about the filling of the Spirit in the book of Acts, that in every case... Except this one, and I'm going to show that this one really isn't an exception. In every case, when we're told in the book of Acts that someone was filled with the Holy Spirit, the immediate result of that is that they begin to testify effectively to Jesus Christ. 
You want a filling of the Spirit? If you have a filling of the Spirit, you'll be a witness to Jesus Christ because, as Jesus himself said, the Spirit's job is to bear witness to me. When he comes, he won't testify of himself, but he will bring to your memory all of the things concerning me, and he will testify of me. That's what Jesus said, John 15 and 16 in there. You see, every time that comes up, those who are filled with the Spirit immediately begin to speak effectively about Jesus Christ. Now, I say this is one exception, and yet, as I also said, it really isn't. Because, number one, it doesn't say they were filled with the Spirit, as a result of which we would expect the consequence, namely speaking, but it says choose men who are filled with the Spirit. How did they know that they were filled with the Spirit? Isn't one way of judging that the fact that they weren't effective witnesses to Jesus Christ? You see, it's just a case of it being inverted here in this text. And I point out as well that this flows on immediately, not the same story, but it flows on immediately to the case of Stephen, first deacon, a man full of wisdom, filled with the Holy Spirit, who does what? Immediately, before the Sanhedrin, gives not only the greatest, but the longest speech of the entire book of Acts, all of which in the end points to Jesus Christ, for which they are so angry that they kill him. So the point I'm making, you see, is that these men who were chosen were not merely wise men. That is, men uh, to whom you could go and say, now, we have a problem and we really don't know what to do. How should we deal with it? And who, out of their wisdom and experience and fed with prayer, would say, I think what you should do is this. Not only men who could do that, though, that was the qualification, one of the qualifications, but also men who were speaking about Jesus, That is not just private men, but public men. Men who not only lived the faith to themselves, but lived it openly before the world and were known to do so. Stephen, of course, being the first great example. Well, here are these deacons. I pointed out that they were Greeks. I pointed out that they were chosen on the basis of their spiritual wisdom and character and their ability to speak and that this is one of the great principles of biblical leadership. Let me point out as well that by electing deacons as the first administrative office in the church, other than that of the apostles, the church was electing people to do what, above all other things, is most essential to the Christian ministry. You see, it's not preaching necessarily so much as it is service on the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you talk about service, and remember, the word deacon means to serve, and diakonos is a servant. When you talk about service, you have to remember that the Bible's evaluation of that is 180 degrees different from the world's evaluation. So you say to people in the world, where are the people in the world who are really important Where are the people in the world who are really great? Well, the people in the world who, in the world's judgment, are important and great are the people, we would say, at the top of the pyramid. Uh, They're the people who have a lot of people under them. If you're talking personally about those who are really up there, they're the ones that have so much money that even today, when people don't want to work for anybody, they have servants. Somebody who has servants, my goodness, they have really made it. And when you talk about business, the people who are really important are the ones that are over everybody else. Down at the bottom, you have most of us, then you have supervisors, and then you have middle management, and then you have the people at the top, the vice president, and then you have the chairman of the board. Wow. And then we pay them well, of course. And I'm not complaining about that. I think people who can manage well, that's an important thing. That deserves its own kind of reward. But, you see, the way we think about importance is this. We think that the people who are really important are those who have the most number of people under them, working for them. And you see, that isn't the way Jesus treated it. Jesus said what? The great of this world, that is, as I evaluate greatness, are the ones who serve. Want to be great in God's sight? Try serving people. You want to be greater in God's sight? Try serving more people. The more people you can serve, the greater you will be in God's sight. And that includes things that the world would call menial. Remember Jesus Christ, when he was about to be arrested and crucified, when he wanted to give a graphic demonstration of what that meant to his disciples, got them together in that upper room, 
And then he took off his robes and he knelt down before each of his disciples, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of glory, the King of kings, on his knees before these Galilean fishermen, peasants, tax collectors, all of that. And he took the role of a servant and he washed their feet. Peter understood how incongruous that was, at least from his point of view. He said, you're never going to wash my feet. You know, I'd rather be dirty than have you have to get down here and wash my feet. Peter didn't say, no, Lord, let me wash. He just didn't want the Lord to wash him. He wasn't going to take on the Lord's job. He just thought it inappropriate to the Lord. If it was inappropriate to the Lord, it was certainly inappropriate to Peter. And he didn't quite get it. He objected. But Jesus had to point out that, that that wasn't it. He said, you don't let me do that. You don't have any part of me. You want to be mine. If you want to be my disciple, this is the role. I do it. When he finished, he said, you understand what I've done? Servant isn't greater than his Lord. If I've taken that role in order to serve you, then you must take that role in serving one another. You see, when we talk about these deacons, we're talking to that which is absolutely essential. You don't have Christianity without dysfunction. And in a certain sense, in a very real sense, I mean it, in a very real sense, these men now become the leaders of the church. And they don't replace the apostles. The apostles had a special role. The Lord said he was going to give the scriptures through them, and he did. And they spoke with apostolic authority and all of that. I don't mean that. But you see, these men become the leaders. Have you thought about that, how that works out in the book of Acts? Up till now, we've had the apostles. Apostles doing their thing, Peter on Pentecost, Peter, John before the Sanhedrin, and all the apostles hauled in and put in jail and delivered and beaten and counting it a great honor to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. The apostles, the apostles, the apostles. Oh, my, what a church that must have been. Preacher Peter, preacher Paul, preacher James, preacher so on. And then now you have these men, and you know from this point on you don't find those apostles very much. Oh, Peter comes up again. He's there in chapter 10 because Peter, with his Jewish prejudice, didn't want to take the gospel to any of those Gentiles. I mean, converts to Judaism, Hellenists were one thing, but uh, the pure Gentiles were something else. And God had to deal with him, and God used him to bring the gospel to Cornelius. That's a great story. But, you know, it's the only place. You find these original 11 apostles in the whole book. And what happens from this point on, you see, beginning in verse 8, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, you have his sermon, chapter 7, and his martyrdom, the very end, and in chapter 8, those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And Philip, Philip, went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. And then God took Philip and used him to bring the gospel to the Ethiopian. And so the gospel spread beyond the bounds of Judaism, not through the apostles, but through these deacons and so on throughout the book. Our way of saying it would be to say that these men really carried the ball. I don't think it's quite fair to say, but one suspects that the apostles themselves, at least to some extent, dropped it. They weren't the evangelists, you see. Oh, it's right, God called Paul, and he went. And at one place, Barnabas is called an apostle. Maybe he had a call similar to that of the apostle Paul. But these original 11, all we find them doing is huddling around there in Jerusalem. So when there's troubles in the church and they go back and they have a council, we're told about it later on in Acts, the 15th chapter, they're all there in Jerusalem. And meanwhile, the gospel is going into all the world through people like Philip and Stephen and the other men about whom we don't know very much, but were undoubtedly great witnesses. I guess what I want to challenge you to do is be a deacon, be a servant like these men. You want to do it well, you have to do it like Stephen did. This chapter ends with his arrest, and then the next chapter gives us his sermon, And as it tells us about Stephen, it tells us several things about him. It tells us that he was like Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that in so many words, but if you look at verse 8 of the chapter, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. And then look 
When you have a moment at Luke 24, 19, a verse written about Jesus Christ by the same author, that is by Luke, you'll find these same words used of Jesus. And Luke sums up Jesus' ministry. He sums it up saying that he was full of God's grace and power and he did great wonders and signs among the people. And this is what Stephen did. It was like Jesus Christ. If you want to be a deacon, you've got to be like Jesus Christ because he's the first deacon. He's the model for it. He's the one who counted it not something to be grasped, to hang on to his prerogatives of Godhead, but emptied himself and became a man even unto death that he might serve us. You say, I don't like that. I don't want to serve. Well, no, that's true. (laughs) We don't in ourselves want to serve. We want people to serve us. But that's the pattern. And if I may say so, it gets worse because the service is even unto death. That's what happened in the case of Jesus, and it's what happens to Stephen. He is so much like Jesus Christ, and he speaks the gospel of Jesus Christ with such wisdom and power that they're overcome by his preaching and resent it and say, we've got to get rid of this man just the way we got rid of Jesus. And so they do. And yet as he dies, he is still like Jesus. He's even speaking Jesus' words. He says, forgive them, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. That's the bottom line. Are you like that? Do you want to be? If you want to be, Jesus wants you to be. And he'll teach you what it means to be a servant. Let us pray. Father, we look at our own hearts and we can't pretend that what's held out before us here as a model of the Christian life, what it really means to be spiritual, is something that appeals to us. It definitely does not appeal to us. We're glad to have servants in the church as long as they're serving us. But to serve them, to serve others, especially to serve the unlovely and to do it in menial ways and to do it while we are encountered with opposition and abuse and harsh language and unjust accusations. That we don't want to do. Our Father, we read the Bible. We know what it says. We know that's what we must do. Teach us to do it. Give us grace to do it. And above all, above all, make us want to do it and love to do it because that's what it means to serve our Lord. Amen and amen. You're listening to the Bible Study Hour with the Bible teaching of Dr. James Boyce, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. For Canadian gifts, mail those to 237 Rouge Hills Drive, Scarborough, Ontario, M1C2Y9. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to the Bible Study Hour.